united to serve, you know, and, and, and being in one accord and having that unity with each other as, as, as we serve and continue to serve in one accord. In the book of Philippians, the second chapter, verses 1 and 4, I'll read those scriptures before we pray, and then we'll go into our lesson this morning. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter while on house arrest, and it says here, If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, another word for that is encouragement, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowness of mind, let, it let each esteem others better than themselves. Verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Father, we thank you for your word. As we read your scriptures, we pray for revelation. God, we, we, we've, had, we've had our praise and worship. We had a time to fellowship. We had a time to, to give, to worship you in, in those matters. But now is the time to hear, to gain revelation. I ask you to speak to each and every one of our hearts as we discuss and as we talk about these scriptures and about your word, which is the inspired word of God. When we read the word, it's you speaking to us, God, through the scriptures. So we thank you now that we may have understanding and that we can apply it to our lives and be better Christians. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. In this book, as you study the history of this book, the Church of Philippi, you know, as we read, was a, was a given church. It was a church that supported Paul. But it was a church that overall had, was a church that served in unity. They served in, in unity and in one accord. But when you go to chapter 4, I think it is, it talks about there was two women who, was, who, who were leaders in this church that had a, a disagreement with one another. They had a disagreement with one another. So here the Apostle Paul was addressing that, that disagreement. He was addressing that disagreement to the church. And he was telling them how important it is to be unified. And he was giving them instructions on how to be unified, how to be in one accord. And on last week, we talked about seven traits. As we look at these four scriptures, there are seven traits that will unify the church to serve. That will unify the church to serve. And as I mentioned last week, and as we did the book drive, and as, as we did uh, the Servant Sunday, you know, on Sunday, everybody worked together. And everybody worked together, and we had good results. That's what unity does. Yes. It gives you good results. You, you see the fruit of your labor. So Paul understood that it was important for the church to serve in unity, and it was important to have to deal, it was important to deal with, with disunity quickly. You know, whenever there's disunity or disharmony in a ministry, we have to deal with it quickly. Quickly, because it can hinder our service. And we said there were seven traits, and as we looked at those scriptures in verse 1, and he says that, and therefore, and there be therefore any consolation. We said one of the traits was encouragement. We have to encourage one another. In the kingdom, we have to encourage one another, to, to, to just encourage one another and comfort one another, to build each other up, you know, in the kingdom, in, in, in this, as believers. And then it says that there be any consolation of Christ, any comfort of love. We, another trait, we have to learn to love one another. We have to love one another as we serve, loving, loving one another. And it says if there be any fellowship of the Spirit, we've we got to make sure that we maintain that fellowship in the Spirit. I think we use the scripture in Ephesians, I think it was 4 and 2, endeavoring to keep the unity of Spirit in the bond of peace. Make every effort to keep the unity of Spirit in a bond of peace. And then we said, we talked about that compassion. You know, he says there being any bowels or, and, and mercies. He was talking about that compassion. We've got to have compassion for one another. Yeah. Compassion for one another. The Bible said Christ was moved with compassion. So we too have to have compassion for one another. Mm -hmm. But I want to pick up here in verse 2. When Paul says, fulfill ye my joy. Fulfill me my joy. Paul had the joy of the Lord. We know that, that joy comes from God. But what Paul was saying is that my joy will be fulfilled. In other words, my joy will be running over. I am, I do have the joy of the Lord. 
but my jaw will be running over yes. if I know you're working together. If I know that you're unified. If I, if I know that, that, that you get you on one accord with one another. And then it says, fulfill ye my joy that, that ye may be like-minded. That ye may be like-minded, having, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. I want to deal with just a few minutes here. What does it mean to be in one accord? Because the Bible mentioned that term so, so many times in the New Testament. What does it mean to be in one accord? Well, the Greek word for that is homothomathon. Homothomathon. H-O-M-O-T-H-U-M-A-D-O-N. Homothomathon. Which means having the same mind or spirit. That doesn't mean, this is not talking about we all going to think alike in everything. You know, some of us going to have good thinking, but we, 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 we support the right basketball team. Okay? But it's okay if you support a state or, or that other light blue, color blue, what is it, Carolina team. It's okay. But we still are in one accord. But what I'm saying is the Bible doesn't say we all have to think alike in everything. Because we're different. We're unique. That's why he brings us together, because you have information that I need, and I have information that you need. We can put our thoughts together, and we can make something happen. Mm -hmm. But he was talking about being in one mind and purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, having the same purpose, which, which goes back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Having the same purpose, you know, in life. That word means to have the same mind. It means to have a oneness of mind and heart. This word, as you look up this, this Greek word here, that's for one accord, is used 12 times and 13 times in the New Testament. 12 times in the book of Acts. And one time in the book of Romans. The goal here, what Paul was getting at, is we have to have the mind of Christ. We, we have to be Christ-like in our thinking. We have to have the same purpose. We, you know, we may can talk about how to get there. We may talk about how to get to, to Crabtree Mall. That is our purpose. We, we all going in the same direction. But now we may have some disagreements and some better ideas on which route to take. But being in one accord means we got to get to Crabtree Mall. And if there's anything that's hindering us from getting to Crabtree Mall, which is division, then we have to deal with that. That's what Paul means, having the same mind. Being in one accord. We have the same purpose. I'm like, that is Jesus Christ. That is to be Christ-like. You know, we have the same purpose. We have, we have the same goal in life. I mean, we try, I mean, when we had the book bag, we had the same goals. We was able to work together. And so and suddenly you had the same goal. Everybody did what they were supposed to do, but we was in one accord. Yes. And that's what Paul was dealing with here, because he knew the importance of the church. We have to be united in spirit. We have to do, that's why said, he said we have to endeavor to keep you in the spirit and the bond of peace. Because we know when, we, when we're not unified, that hinders the flow of God. Jesus. You know, the Bible talks about, behold how pleasant, and, and Psalms 133, behold how pleasant, how good it is for brother to dwell together. Why? In unity. We, I mean, we have to be unified if we're going to see the move of God. A dysfunctional church cannot see the move of God. It hinders the move of God. If we're arguing and we can't agree on anything and, and, and we, we just, we can't get anything done because we're not, we don't have the same purpose. We don't have the same goal. But it's saying here, we must have the same goal, the same purpose. We must be Christ-like and we have to deny our flesh and do everything that we have to do to maintain that unity. Sometimes we have to bite our tongue to maintain unity. Mm, that's hard, isn't it? I had to learn that sometimes I sometimes I would just say, I'm the pilot, I don't talk that much, but but when you when you touch me the wrong way, I, I hold it in for a while, but as I hold it in, I have my point. And there's a point where I just let it go. You know, and I had to learn to bite my tongue when I got to that point. Now don't just don't say anything, because you have to keep that unity. Deal with it in a spirit of love. You know, deal with it in a spirit of love and and because and, and, you gotta keep that unity. So Paul here with them, that's what it means, uh, homo or uh, thomathon, means, means to have the same mind, to have the same desires. Our desires is to do what Christ has called us to do. The same longing, the, 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 we, we want the same things, the same purpose, having the same goal, which is to glorify God. So we have the same goal and purpose. We are one, we are one accord. Our goal is to glorify God. It's not there for us to get the glory. It's not for me to get the glory. When we serve it, it is to do what? It is to glorify God. Who gets the glory? God gets the glory. Being in one accord. That's what it means. It means that we have the same goal to serve and to love God. To be in one accord means we've got to set our differences aside. And that's what Paul was doing. We have to put our differences aside. 
and we have to serve together. In other words, we have to be on the same sheet of music. You know how to say it? Or on the same page. Yeah, we, had a, we had a conversation say, no, you're not on the same page. This is not going right. We got to get you on the same page. We got to get you on the same sheet of music. It means we got to be going in the same direction. Be in one accord. Be in one accord to glorify God. That's what Paul was doing here. We, got, we have to glorify God. Jesus was, was about being in one accord. I want to go to John uh, chapter 17, verse 11 uh, from the English Standard Version. Look what, look what Jesus said here, being, being one. He says in John, it was after Jesus was praying, he said in John 17 and 11, he says, and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be what? One, even, even as we are what? One. So he prayed, as we read those scriptures, that the body may be one of us, that we may be in one accord. And we may be one body. We are one accord. We have the same purpose in life. You know, the same purpose in life. We are one accord. And then I want to go to the book of Acts. Because being in one accord, the book of Acts talks a lot about being in one accord. Being in one accord is the exact opposite of division. Now, what creates division in the house? This is what Paul had to deal with. What creates division in the house? Here's some of the things that may create division in the house of God. Jealousy creates division. When we get jealous of one another, somebody has a calling on their life and somebody else wants that calling on their life, but they don't have that calling, so they're jealous of that person that has that calling. Somebody may be a great teacher and another person may be great in something else, but they envy or they're jealous of that person who is a great teacher. Or, or you have somebody who's, who's been teaching Sunday school for, for the last 13 years and, and God is sending in a younger, gifted, uh, talented, and, and, and anointed people to teach and the older ones get a little jealous, but they don't want to give up that position. That's what causes division. I, I, our pastor used to tell us, don't get too used to serving in, in, in one capacity because you may be moved next month. Don't get too used. Don't, 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 don't grab a hold of it like it's, like, like it's yours. Take ownership of it, but be willing to release it at any given time. Because it's about the kingdom. It is about being in one accord. It's about getting and reaching our goals. And sometimes we have to move things around to reach that goal. Whatever we have to do to reach that goal, that's what we have to do. Sometimes a football team has to change people around in different positions. Well, we got to change you. you. You can't play cornerback. We need you at, at safety. Or you can't play safe. We need you on the, on the other end of the ball. We need you as, a, as, as an offensive end. You're going to do better for the team there. Sometimes you have to switch things around, but they have the same goal, and that goal is to win. So whatever it takes to win, or in the spiritual realm, whatever it takes to be fruitful, we may have to move some things around. That's what it means to be in one accord. That's what it means to be one. I remember I was a praise and worship leader, me and my wife, and we got sat down. We, they sat us down for a bit of praise and worship leader. But they had gifted people come in that could, that, 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 well, my wife can sing better than I can. But they had gifted people that could come in that could sing. They were anointed. That's what they did. Then the pastor, well, he was our social pastor at the time. Pastor Harold called us in. He was, he was a minister of music. He called us in like I shared before. And he said, y'all guys, y'all season is up. That was just a way of saying in love. And I learned that technique, so I have to use that. That's just my way of showing up. Uh, brother, my sister, your season is up. God has some other things for you to do in life. You understand? But I understood what was going on. Because it's about what? The same, we had the same purpose. That the people may glorify God. Ushering people to the presence of God. And whoever can come in that can be more effective at that. That's what it means to be in one accord. That's what it means to be in one accord. But so long in the church, we had a position, we held on to that position, and you better not move me from that position. This is my position. Don't even move me from that position. This is mine. And that creates division. Look, somebody said, it's all God's anyway. If somebody can do it better than me, then let them do it. If somebody come on the football team, if, if they can run the ball better than me, then they need to run the ball. Because if we win, we all get a championship ring. Regardless of whether I'm on the See, this is the thing about sports. You don't even have to play. You don't even have to get on the field. But when your team wins, you can wear your Super Bowl ring around like everybody else and be proud and tell your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, I was a star on the football team. They don't know. They're too young to even watch the Super Bowl, too. You know, you can tell them you're a star on the football team. But the point is, you still win. So in the kingdom of God, it's still the same way. 
Regardless of who's doing what. Regardless of who does it better. Guess what? We all glorify God. We all win. We all fruitful. We all doing what God has asked us to do. We all score the touchdown. When one score a touchdown, that's why you see when one person score a touchdown, the whole team run out there and celebrate. Why? Because we all score the touchdown. Amen. Team. That's why I like to go to State Warriors. For those of you who, who may not follow back, that's why I like to go to State Warriors. They have many superstars on their team. But you know what? They don't care who hits 30 points each night. They don't care. They just know they're so good that somebody gonna get 30 points. Regardless of if it's if Seth Curry one day, if it's, uh, what's his name, the new guy they got? Uh, who? Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant the next day, or, or, or it, one of the other guys, or Green the next day. They don't care who gets the 30 points. Thompson, they don't care. The point is, we all have a championship ring. You don't see them arguing about, I want to be traded. You know, I, I can't get my, my points in. You don't see that with this team. And they don't win many more championships unless they get older or some of them go on and make more money in other places because they understand being in one accord, even from a secular standpoint. They understand the importance of being on one accord. It doesn't matter who got 30 points. It doesn't matter who's on the all-star team. We all wearing the ring around here. We all have a championship ring. That's what it means to be on one accord. It doesn't matter who's serving and who's doing what. It doesn't matter if we have to move each other around. It doesn't matter why. Because we all win. It doesn't matter. We all win. And so that's what really Paul was dealing with. And in the book of Acts, I want to share some scriptures in the book of Acts. The book of Acts deal with this, this word being in one accord. Being in one accord. Being of the same mind. Having, having the same purpose. Serving together. Unified to serve. In the book of Acts, I want to read some of the scriptures. The book of Acts, verse 1 and 14. The book of Acts, verse 1 and 14. Listen to what it says here. And it says, these all, they, these all continue one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. The women was involved, and Mary, and the mother of Jesus, and with the brother. There was in one accord praying for, for the, before the day of Pentecost for the Holy Spirit. God promised them the promised Holy Spirit. They were all together in one place, what? Praying in one accord. There was in one accord. And then in verse uh, Acts 2 and 1, look what it says in Acts 2 and 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, the Bible said they were all, and here's that word again, in one accord. What? In one place. And then the Holy Spirit fell upon all of them. Why? Because it was in one accord. When the church is united in one accord, God can do awesome things. We cannot limit what God can do if we stay unified. If we continue to serve with the same mind, with the same purpose. If we stay connected together that way, and if we stay connected in the Spirit, God can do awesome things because God flows through a unified body. Yes. It's like Aaron's beard. How good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It's like a precious oil that runs down Aaron's beard. It's like an anointing when you serve in unity together. You notice know you can get a lot more done when you're unified, mm -hmm. but you can get nothing done if you divide. I've been in meetings when we were divided, we couldn't get nothing done. Why? Because there was division. We couldn't agree on anything, couldn't accomplish anything, because there was division. But when we got unified, then God moves. Then God flows. What do you think? It's, it's like every time we used, to plan, we used to plan a major event, something will always come up. Some division will try to sneak in. And we have to deal. You have to, you have to plan a major event. You have to do with a lot of people. It's like, okay, I mean, everything was going good, and all of a sudden, you got these attitudes or something happening, you know, between people, members on the team. That's the way an enemy will bring in disharmony because he know God doesn't flow when there's the body is not unified. But when the body is unified, we can serve because God flows and we are fruitful and we see the fruit of his labor. And there's nothing that God cannot do through a group of people who are unified. Who are unified? This is what it says in Acts 2, 46 and 47. And they continued day with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Did eat meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord did what? As the church daily, such as should be saved. But verse 46 said, they continued daily with one accord. They were unified. Romans 15 and 6 says that they may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. Mm -hmm. 
even the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. It says that with one mind and one mouth, they glorified God. There's that word again, one accord. That same Greek word is used 13 times because it was so important. One accord. One accord. But something happened in the early church. Acts, the book of Acts, it talks how the church was, was in one accord. But some centuries, some, not centuries, but, but a few decades or a couple of decades later, they had to deal with division in the church. If you read the book of Corinthians, they dealt with division in the church. And in Galatians, they dealt with division in the church. Let me give you a story. I want to go to Genesis. Genesis, I'm going to skip to Genesis 11 chapter. I want to go there. I want to talk about an example of, 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 of the Tower of, of Babel. Babel, which, which, which also is short for, for Babylon. That's where they got Babylon from because Nimrod, who was the leader, he founded the city of Babylon. But I want to go to Genesis, Genesis the 11th chapter. I want to show you how being unified, even from a secular standpoint, you can make progress. But God destroyed that work because they didn't put God in it. We'll talk about that too. But, but, but just being unified, even from a secular standpoint, I gave an example of a basketball team who is a good basketball team that's probably going to win more championships because they're unified. They're in one accord. See, even in the secular arena, if you're in one accord, if you're unified, you can get some things accomplished. Even in the secular arena. Even in the secular arena. Okay? I want to go to Genesis 11 chapter to illustrate a point here. Genesis 11 chapter, starting with, with verse 1. This is talking about here the Tower of, of Babel. Of Babel, the Tower of Babel. And, and, and here in this, in this scripture, Nimrod here had, these, first of all, these were the descendants of, of, of Noah. After God had destroyed the earth, he repopulated the earth again, and these were the descendants of Noah here. So they have grown in numbers around this time. And this is what it says here, because, because they unified for a specific purpose, even though it wasn't a godly purpose. But they still accomplished something that God had to come in and intervene. He had to come in and intervene to stop them from doing what they were doing because they was in one accord and they had the same purpose. This is what it says here in, in, in Genesis 11, uh, 1 and 8. And it says, and the whole earth was of one language and of what? One speech. So they were speaking the same, but they only had one language at that time. You didn't have, you didn't have Spanish, you didn't have all these other languages, Russia. There was one language at this time. They were all speaking the same language. And they were all on one accord. And, and Nimrod, somehow he, he was able to get the people to, to, to buy into his vision and to work together. And the verse 2 says, And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the uh, land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. That's also the land of Babylon. They dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. That they had, and they had brick for stone and slime, and, and they for mortar. In other words, it was building, building the tower. It was being prepared to, to build this tower. Okay? And there was a one accord. There was a one accord. And it says, and, and, and they said, go. It says here in verse 4. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower, a tower whose top may reach the heavens. In other words, we're going we're, we're to build a tower that's going to reach the heavens. You know, they, 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 they was determined, they was, and they was unified, and there was a one accord, and they spoke the same thing. In other words, when they spoke the same thing, they was able to communicate and to get something common. We're we going to build this tower. We're going we gonna to reach the heavens. And when you study the history of that, really, what Nimrod was doing, he, he didn't want the people to get scattered. He wanted the people, all the people, under his kingdom. Because he knew if they got scattered, that, that there would be conflict and, and division, then there would be war. So he wanted everybody under his kingdom. So really he was building a, a, a religious type of thing. And, and, and really it wasn't about God, it was about reaching heaven so they can, so they can have their own religion. It was, it, it was based on self-effort here. God was not included. And in and, and, and verse 4 again it says, and they said, go to, let us build the city and, and, and a tower whose top may reach into heaven and let us make us a name. That was about making a name for a while, themselves. Everything they've done here, when you read the book of Philippians, the second chapter, it is opposite of what God wants us, how he wants us to be. It was a lot of pride here and, and self-effort here. And listen, and it says, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. In other words, we can't allow the people to get scattered. i got to bring people under our kingdom. So we're going to build this tower and we're going to reach the heavens. It's going to be like we are gods. 
And people are going to worship us. We can't let it be scattered. And the first time says, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men of men built. So the Lord had to come down and see what well, these people are accomplishing something here. Now we know that they would have never built something by man on earth that was going to reach heaven. God knew that. They would never reach heaven. You can't reach heaven that way. But it was their way of building a religious kingdom of their own without God. But there was a, they, were, they, they were so unified that they were accomplishing something. They was getting it done. They was building this, this tower. The, the, and they were so successful, the Lord had to come down to see, what, look, what, look what these people are doing here. And it says, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one. Even, the Lord, even from a second symbol, God says, the people are one. In other words, they have the same purpose. They have the same goal. They're running with the same vision. They are one accord. They speak in the same language. Those are the things that Paul was telling us to do. And you see, if we do that in the spiritual side, how much more can we accomplish if God is on our side? And what God would do through us. But they will accomplish something here without God, which represents self-effort. Let me tell you something about self-effort. We can't accomplish some things on earth without God. Y'all know that, don't you? You can go to college. You can get a good job. There's wealthy people. There's millionaires that don't care about God, don't love God, don't know God, but they're filthy rich. There are some things, self-effort, you can do without God. But here's the thing. It will not last. It will not last. It's, it's, it's man-made. That, that system will collapse. But all the things that we do for Christ will last. So, so God had to come down and see here. He said, the people are one. And it says, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. In other words, God was saying, these folks are so unified. And they have the same purpose. And, and, and they and so, so, so have the same thought, have the same goal, have the same revision that these folks can accomplish something here. Okay? They can accomplish something here because, because they are working together. Look what God says in verse 7. He says, go to, let us go down there and what? Confound their language or confuse their language that they may be not able to understand one another. From this day forth, that's why we have all the different languages in the land. Because God came down to confuse them because they were speaking the same language. There was a such unity. There was unified. There was accomplishing something here apart from God. We knew it wasn't going to last. But the point is, they were making progress even on the secular side because they were unified. Even companies that don't even care about God, don't even worship God, they teach you in management class. Y'all got to work together. They bring you on, they, that's why they take you on these retreats. And, and I've been on these retreats, and they put us out in some, some wilderness somewhere in a cabin and say, y'all are going to live together for, 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 eight, you know that, for eight weeks. And you go, not, not eight weeks straight, but you got to go a week, then later on you go another week. Y'all are going to live together for eight weeks, and we're going to do some team building exercises with you all. We're going to blindfold you, put you on a ladder, make you fall backwards, and you got to pray that y'all, I hope that your co-workers catch you. They did stuff like that because they understood the concept. And the concept was, if we're going to be successful at what we do, you're going to have to work together. You're going to have to be on the same page. You're going to have to, see, even the secular world understands unity. But they understand unity without Christ. And that's what was happening here. They understood that they could get a lot accomplished if they were unified. But God said, they, they're doing too much. God had to come down. And they had to confuse their language. What happened when you confuse their language? They couldn't communicate with one another effectively. They were speaking so many different languages, it hindered the work. It stopped the work because they couldn't communicate. It was disunity from that point on. And God stopped the work that Nimrod had set out to do. Because Nimrod had a gift. He knew how to, he knew how to unify the people. He knew how. So the power was by force. But he knew how to unify the people. He had them all on one accord, 
with the same thoughts, with the same goal, with the same purpose, to build this wall, to have this kingdom without God being involved in it. And that's why God had to come down and stop it, because God wanted and he had to be involved in the affairs of man. So he did what? He confused their language. Pride was a part of this. Nimrod had pride. Pride is, is just self-effort. I don't need God. That was Nimrod's, uh, Nimrod's personality. I don't need God. We can accomplish this. But here's the point I'm making in this whole sermon here. Even the secular world can accomplish some things if they're in one accord, if they're unified. That's what Paul was saying to the church. If we're unified, if we're on one accord, if we, if, we, if, we, if we deal with division, and we have the same mind, and we have the same purpose, we can accomplish a lot of things in the kingdom of God. God said, I can flow through a unified body. So, message of hope, don't doubt what God can do. Never limit what God can do. When you look around, you don't limit God just by looking around here. God can do awesome things, even in this ministry. And he will do a lot of great things if we remain unified. Yes. If we remain unified. Yes. That's, why we, that's why I always pray, you know what? When, 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 when new members come in, when new people come in, I'm praying, God, God, let them have our spirit. Let them be unified with us. You know, let them, let, let them be unified with us. That's why, you know, I, I, I've been taught, I've been trained over the years, even when people come in with other, with other titles, Regardless if you was an elder or a deacon or, or an evangelist, when you come here, you got, you, got to, you got to submit under this leadership and let us determine that, how you're going to operate in this house. I, I mean, I served for many years as an elder, and, and at one point in my life, I was between churches, and, then I, and I ended up going down with Pastor Herbert. I was in between, and for two years, I had the title of an elder, but when I visit churches, I wasn't Elder John Maness. I was just a lay member. I, I, I was just a lay member. It, it doesn't matter if I, if I have an apostle behind my name or, or prophet behind my name or evangelist behind my name. That's okay from where you came from. But when you come into this house, and if you want to join this house, then you got to submit to the order of this house. And you have to be ordained in this house. Because why? That maintains what? Unity. Because people cannot be released if they're not on the same page, they're not flowing in the same spirit, if they're not on one accord with what we are doing, then you can't just come in. That cause division. And that's why Paul said we have to be on one accord. Same mind. I don't mean we got to think alike. I know some of you state fans. I still love you. Carolina fans, I still love you. We're getting all good together. Hallelujah, God. Just pray that God would deal with your mind one day. But anyway, hallelujah. Praise God. You'll be healed one day. I'm still praying for you, but we don't want to call it. That's what it means. Sometimes when people think about, oh, they're trying to tell me how to think. They're trying to control. No, we're not trying to control. Nobody might. We're going to think different. That's good. That's why we have team leaders. I want to know what you think because I don't have all the answers. You may have a better way of doing it than I haven't even thought about doing it. That's why it makes it so unique to work together and be one accord. Because if we know that we got the same goal in mind, we want to get across that touchdown line, Bobby. I may think we're going to want a, a, a running play. You may say, no, Pastor, we need to do a, a pass play because the defense is tough on the front line. And someone else may say, well, let's do a, a trick play. Let's trick them up. Either way, we all have the same goal in mind. And this is the thing about being unified. If we win, we all win. If we lose, we all lose. So if I made a call and we lost, or I listened to your call and we lost, we all lost. That's how the game is played, ladies and gentlemen. That's why it's so unique to be unified. To be unified together. And when we're unified, Paul says here, he says in the scriptures, so to be one accord, let's go back to the book of Philippians as I close here. The book of Philippians, he said, be fulfilled your joy, be like-minded, having the same love, one for another, been in one accord, in one mind. Let nothing be done through strife and vain growth. This is the enemy of unity. That's right. Strife, right. self glory. That's, that's, that's the enemy. Vain glory, deceit. Mm -hmm. You know, wanting to be top, wanting, wanting to have a top position, but you're not anointed to be in that position. That's what we're talking about being strife and vain glory. But in what? When we serve, in what? Lowness of mind. 
Let each esteem our others even better than ourselves. Yes. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man what? On the things of others. Basically, what, what Paul is really saying in a nutshell, it's not about you. Mm. It's not about me. If we don't want a car, it's about Christ. Amen. Just stand. Amen. Amen. And give God some praise. Amen. Amen. Being one for being unified. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we leave here today, we thank you for the word that's been taught, and we can apply it to our word. Thank you for this unified body. Well, God, we know as we grow, we know there will be some come in that will need to be taught and need to be trained, God, on how to maintain unity in the body of Christ and to apply the scriptures in Philippians chapter 2 that it's not about us. And as we read further in the scripture, Jesus gave us an example. He was a great example of what it means to walk in humility. So we thank you right now, God, that as we leave for the day, that we will all walk in humility. We will all be on one accord. Now, we are not ignorant of the enemy devices. We come against any division that will creep into the house. We come against anything, God, that will create disharmony in the house. Because we want to be a unified body to be used by you, Father. Yes. We want that anointing to be on this house. We may not agree on everything, but we have the same goal. We have the same purpose. To make a difference in people's lives. To touch people's lives. To win the loss for Jesus Christ. We have the same goals. Whatever it takes to get that done, God, we are open to that. I don't have all the answers. None of us have all the answers. But the answer is in the house. Somebody has the answer. Because you have gifted each of us, Father. And you gave each of us a responsibility and gift us. So we thank you now, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Greet somebody.